My name is Hilary McCollum. I'm going to be reading from Gold Digger, which is published by Bella Books. It's set between the California gold rush and the Irish famine. Frances Moriarty has fallen in love with another young woman, Kitty Gorman. They've embarked on a secret relationship. In this scene, Kitty and Frances go with Kitty's mother to awake. And we join it just as the crowd are saying the rosary for the dead man. As the final Hail Mary is echoing around the crowd, Kitty turns to me. I'll go and tell my mother we're away home. Shouldn't we wait for her? No, she'll be here for the night sitting up with Bridie. It's just you and me. She winks at me, an extravagant wink that sets me shivering and flushing at the same time. I'm going to be sleeping with Kitty. I've been wanting this chance, but now that it's upon me, I am terrified. Will she just expect to go to sleep? It has been a long and tiring day and she is surely exhausted. Or will she want something more? And what might that more be? I've seen the animals rutting in the fields. I know this happens between a husband and a wife to get a baby. But I have not the first idea what I might be supposed to do with Kitty. I have no wish to be humping at her like a dog. You're a quiet one tonight, Kitty says, as we walk back towards Bally Ferreter. So are you. That I am, she says, hooking her arm into mine. I've been thinking about old William. I was forgetting how long you must have known him, I say. She shakes her head. It's not so much that I'm sad for him. Sure, he lived till 83 and died with his family around him. It's my own life has me thinking. I don't want to waste a minute of it. Her voice is urgent now. She pulls me to her and kisses me. I stand in her arms in the moonlight. I don't want to waste a minute with you, she says, then kisses me again, a long kiss, minutes long. I can feel it everywhere. I'm tingling and breathless. She breaks off. Let's go home. I'm full of nerves again as we enter her cabin. She leaves me building the fire back up while she takes the lantern out to the privy. I can hardly look at her when she returns. She puts her hand on my shoulder. Your turn, she says. I barely need the lantern to find my way. The moon is so bright. On the way back to the cabin, I find water in the pail near the door. I splash my face and dry it on my sleeve, then swirl water around my mouth. Finally, I comb my hair with my fingers, wanting to look my best for her. I open the door of the cabin. Kitty's already in bed. She holds the covers open. Below them, she's naked. I look away, unsure what to do. Don't be scared, she says. I slip off my clothes, aware of her eyes on me. At last, I join her in bed. We lie side by side, looking at each other by the light of a couple of candles. I've grown up in a room of sisters, but I've never really looked at a naked woman before. Her skin is pale, arms lightly freckled, body soft curves, hair a dark red. Slowly I stretch my hand towards her, touching her down her right side. A thrill jumps through me as I feel her warm flesh beneath my fingers. I must kiss her. She answers me with one that is deep and strong, her arms coming about me, her breasts against me. I come away breathless gazing into her eyes for a moment, then looking away. Don't be shy, darling Frankie, Kitty says, leaning in to kiss me on the cheek. And don't forget to breathe. I let my breath out in a rush. We both laugh. There's no hurry, she says. I nod. I could never have imagined feeling like this. It makes me tremble. Yet only a few months ago, I didn't even know you. I feel tears behind my eyes and bury my head in her shoulder. She strokes my hair. There now, darling. She lifts my hand towards her mouth and kisses it. Gentle kisses landing on my fingers and palm. I look up at her. She kisses my forehead below my eye where the tears have fallen. My cheek to the left of my mouth, my lips. My mouth opens. I feel her tongue against mine. I kiss her back, fierce and passionate. The whole of my body is alive and tingling. I seek her breast with my hand, 
circling the edge with my fingers, progressing slowly to the center. The nipple hardens and rises in response to my touch. I move so I can take it in my mouth. Her breath quickens. Is this right? I whisper. Yes. Oh yes, she answers. We carry on like this long into the night, touching and stroking and kissing till there is no part of her I do not know, till she has taken me to a place I had no idea existed, stripped not just to the skin, but to the soul. I fall asleep on my side, head in the crook of her arm, hand resting on her belly. It's early when first awake, but there's enough light to see by. She lies on her back, both arms flung out above her head, the slightest smile on her face. I think I'll lie here for a while, then get up and make my darling breakfast. But it's some time later when I wake again, slowly, gently coming to. I feel her breath on my shoulder, her foot on my calf. My eyes slowly open to see hers looking at me. I cannot help but smile. She kisses the edge of my upturned mouth. Morning, Frankie, she says. So this takes place shortly after Ivy has arrived at the clinic and really thrown Lillian for a loop. So Lillian is going jogging with Amelia, who was one of the protagonists in Spindrift. And she's just like bitching constantly. The feel of her feet pounding the pavement usually helped her burn off steam. Tonight, however, it only seemed to fuel her anger. One full week of working with Ivy had proven that absolutely nothing about the relationship had changed. And the second week was not getting off to a good start. I swear she's out to get me. It is a little weird she ended up here, said Amelia. Just wait till you meet her. It will happen eventually. They turned down a quiet road parallel in the river. Another jogger appeared ahead of them with a little dog. Not food, Amelia told her greyhound. I'm going to need to start taking blood pressure medication. I can't be in the same hospital as her. She's like a dog fart. She permeates. Ahead, the jogger paused to retie a shoe. She didn't pay any attention. All she could think about was the smug smile on Ivy's face when she'd suggested Lillian catch up on the latest issue of Clinician's Brief. Should we cross to the other side of the road? Why? Lillian asked. Amelia pointed at the figure drawing rapidly near. You have to be fucking kidding me. She came to a dead halt, surprising Amelia, as the other jogger looked up from tying her shoe. Ivy's ponytail swayed as she recoiled in surprise. Her running, plants clung to, her running pants clung to her muscular thighs. She must still be riding. And her shirt was the sort of athletic racerback crop top Lillian hated on principle. Growing up in the early 2000s had forever embittered her against clothing that bared her midriff. It didn't help that Ivy pulled it off, just as she pulled off everything else. Um, said Amelia. Lillian broke eye contact with Ivy and glanced at her friend, who was staring at both of them with a quizzical tilt to her eyebrows. Ivy's dog, meanwhile, had taken advantage of his owner's distraction to size up Amelia's. The greyhound pretended not to see him. It occurred to Lillian after a moment that there had been a very long and very awkward pause and that as the point of commonality, it was up to her to break it. Amelia, she said, snarling in an approximation of a smile. This is my new coworker, Ivy Holden. As if her name were a charm, Ivy stood in a graceful motion that made Lillian want to hamstring her and called her dog back to her side, where he sat and wagged his stub tail. Nice to meet you. I'm so sorry to interrupt your workout. Were you jogging this way? Ivy pointed down the road they were following. No, said Lillian. At the same time, Amelia said, yes. Ivy's smile grew. Mind if I jog with you for a bit? While Lillian gawked at her, Ivy turned to Amelia. Lil and I went to school together. We used to work out at the same time. I always found her dedication inspiring. If by dedication, you mean my ability to lift more than you, then yes, I agree. Although judging by Ivy's shoulders, those days were over. She'd added muscle in the intervening years, whereas Lillian had stopped lifting regularly and focused mostly on running. There's a metaphor I should never examine too closely, she thought. Ivy said, we'll see about that. How far are you going? They'd already done a mile and usually average three or four. Five, Lillian said. Amelia shot her a sideways glance. Nice, I've been doing six, but I probably should take it easy today. Lillian didn't scream, for which she was very proud of herself. 
Let's get to it then. She took off at a faster clip than normal. She'd regret it soon, but not as much as she'd regret appearing weak in front of Ivy. Amelia and Ivy caught up shortly. She hoped Ivy would jog on Amelia's other side, but instead she flanked Lillian for the sake of the dogs. What about my sake, he thought about saying, but settled for staring at the shoulder of the road as it unspooled before her. Can your dog handle a jog this long? Amelia asked. This little guy? She saw Ivy smile at her dog out of the corner of her eye. He can go longer than I can. Something he and I have in common, said Lillian. This time, Ivy's smile was solely for Lillian. The smirk, she refused to grant a grin status on principle, was as familiar as her favorite sweater. The challenge in Ivy's eyes hardened her resolve even as her heart rate accelerated. This was how it had always been between them. No truce, no mercy, no ground seated, only war. Colorado must be beautiful this time of year, said Amelia. Lillian got the impression she was trying to steer them into less volatile territory. She had learned quickly there was no such thing, but she let Amelia draw Ivy into conversation while she waited for her next opportunity to pounce. Ivy had her charm on full force. She laughed when appropriate and asked leading questions to keep Amelia talking. Was she imagining that Ivy seemed to be having a hard time catching her breath? She picked up her pace fractionally. Ivy, mid-question, matched her with the grim set to her lips. Lillian's legs, lungs, and abdominals were on fire by the time Amelia called for a cool down. She tried not to stagger as she broke into a walk. They were all breathing hard. Ivy's face glowed, a reminder she never turned the beet red shade Lillian did. And she laughed in between deep breaths. Damn well, I forgot how fast you are. It was the closest thing to a compliment she'd ever received from Matthew Holden. Hi, I'm JC Morrison, and I'm reading to you from my latest release, The Found Jar, where single horror romance writer, Emily Harris, has been talked into a North Carolina beach vacation with two couples, her agent Mel and Mel's girlfriend June and Walter and William, the fabulous W's. After settling into her new place, Emily meets Beck, a local college student whose day job is cleaning rental houses. Emily has a number of reasons to fight their attraction, but even repeatedly pushing Beck away hasn't changed those feelings for either of them. This scene begins after Emily and her friends have gone into town where the college is having a dance. Techno music was blaring at a high volume as we entered the converted theater. Bistro tables had been set along the walls and we found an empty one near the middle of the room. I tried to look for Beck without being obvious. She wasn't hard to find. All I had to do was identify the best dancer in the room. Provocative and sexy as hell without being nasty, Beck infused every move with power and grace. June noticed at the subject of my attention. <clears throat> Is that your friend? She asked. I nodded, and after a minute she said, she's really good, and she's hot. Yes, to both, I sighed. When Mel and the guys returned with our drinks, their movement must have drawn Beck's attention because she stopped dancing and was staring in our direction, eyes wide with disbelief. When she began moving toward us, I looked away. I'd wanted to see her, not be seen by her, but when she called my name, I turned back slowly, fighting to suppress my delight at the pleasure in her face. Emily, she said somewhat breathless, I can't believe you're here. Her hair was slightly damp and her body glistened with a light veneer of sweat. Would she look like that after sex? Uh, hi, Beck, I tried to keep my tongue casual. I hope you don't mind that we've crashed your party. You're not crashing. I invited you, remember? Her eyes never wavered from mine. So dance with me. She took my hands and began pulling me onto the dance floor. No, I said laughing as she walked backwards, tugging on my hands alternatively, making me sway. I can't, especially to this music. What are you talking about? She said with a teasing grin. You already are. All right, I said deliberately, not looking back at my friends, but let's move away some more. Beck nodded and kept a firm hold on one hand as we made our way through the jumble of exuberantly moving bodies. Somehow, she signaled the DJ, and the frantic beat slowed. As the volume of the music decreased, the DJ invited all the friends, lovers, sweethearts, romancers, and wannabe couples out onto the dance floor. As the crowd moved around us, I cocked my head. Were you thinking we could be one of those? The corner of her mouth crooked, but her gaze was intense. I think that's up to you. I was casting about for a reply, when the chords of a terribly romantic song from one of the teen vampire movies began playing. 
It had gotten so much radio time. Even I dimly recalled some lyrics about stepping closer. Not a good idea right now. So when Beck's hand enclosed my waist, I startled. Leaning toward me, she murmured, don't be scared, it's just a dance. She took my hand in a classic pose, ready? I realized the music had reached its first chorus and other couples were already circling around us. Taking in a breath, I squeezed my eyes shut as we began to move. Within seconds, I knew this was more than a dance. It was like flying and it was like foreplay. When Beck turned us for the first time, my eyes opened and I stumbled. You're doing great, Emily. Don't think, just feel it, Beck said, her lips brushing my ear. My breath hitched when her hand moved up my side and onto my back. It felt so right that I closed my eyes and did exactly what she said. I let myself feel. I felt the motion of her body and the warmth of her hand through the thin material of my blouse. I felt the pulse of the music and the way our steps matched it. I shifted my hand from Beck's shoulder to lightly caress her neck. Her quiet moan made my head spin. Thank you for this, she whispered, her cheek lightly touching mine. Ever since I saw the way you moved while cleaning my kitchen, I wondered what it would be like to dance with you, I admitted, though in reality, I'd been thinking about something even more intimate as I was now, again. Her face shone with a dazzling smile that made it easy to let her lead me. My body found a natural swing, as if some internal rhythm had synchronized to the beautiful melody. We'd been gliding along face to face, and then she was even closer, pressing herself against me, her chin on my shoulder. At a whiff of her enticing cologne, I closed my eyes again, the, he the heat between us making my nipples tighten. I wondered if she could feel them. As we swung around, coming face to face again, our pelvises brushed and I faltered. She circled us out of the flow of dancers and we stopped over by the wall opposite of my friends. Are you okay? <clears throat> yes, I, I couldn't catch my breath, but it wasn't the dancing. Can't we do this without traveling around so much? Absolutely, she said, pulling me against her. This physical connection and our mutual desire wouldn't be enough to make things work between us but right now, my nerve endings were on overdrive. We were barely moving, our bodies as connected as they could be with clothes on. My mind was busily supplying images of remedying that situation when Beck put her mouth against my hair. I knew you'd feel like this, she whispered, and I tightened my arms around her neck. Maybe just this once, I told myself, tucking my head against her. No one needed to get hurt. We'd regain our senses in the morning and things could go back to the way they'd been before, as if. Instinctively, I knew Beck wasn't the sort of person who could go back, especially from that level of involvement. I raised my head, preparing to say the words that would bring us back to reality, when a man's voice came from behind me. Oh no, you fucking queer. You've gone too far this time. My eyes flew open as Beck was jerked from my arms and punched in the stomach. She doubled over and I screamed. Good morning, this is J.B. Marsden. I'm wearing my spring colors, ironically, since it's only about 15 degrees up here in Illinois. Today I'm gonna to read from my uh, sixth novel upcoming uh, in May of 2021. It builds on characters from my other novels, uh, Reclaiming Yancey and Bobby and Soul. But you don't need to read those two to, um, to buy the next one that's coming out called Yancey in Love. I'm going to read to you a scene after Jen and Yancey get back from their honeymoon. Jen let Yancey finish her dinner. They cleared the dishes and Jen led her to the couch in front of a roaring fire, each carrying a cup of coffee. You did a fine job with the fire, Yancey plopped down on the couch. Thanks, I followed what you taught me. I'm getting the hang of it. They sat sipping coffee. Yancey yawned widely, too tired to talk. Jen stroked Yancey's dark hair, reveling in the softness of her new haircut. Yancey kissed her gently and met her eyes. Never. Let's get on with it. I know you want children. 
Jen loved when Yancey went straight to the point. I do, but do you? Yancey stood with her coffee and stared into the fire for a moment, pacing, her typical response during difficult talks. She turned to Jen, her lips pursed. I'm not sure I'm mother material. If I'm honest, I'm scared to death of screwing up royally. Tell me what's got you uptight. Geez, you name it, it scares me. I'm not mom cuddly like you. I, Nancy searched the room with her eyes. I like the life we have. I'm afraid we'll grow apart with a little one around. You'll, I'll make over the child and leave you to yourself. Oh, Yancey, you need to feel loved. Yeah, something like that. And I'll be jealous and stupid. But you'll also be parenting. I won't be a lone ranger. You'll teach him to her or him to ride. Show them how to be a rancher. You'll play with them. Jen squelched the impulse to rise from the couch and still Yancey's nervous movements. Well, I am good at that kind of thing. But what about when they cry and need, you know, nurturing? Crying makes you anxious. Damn straight, I hate to cry. I hate it when you cry. It, I don't know, crying, it makes me seem weak. When I cry, do you see me as weak? Hell, don't confuse me. When you cry, I just want to comfort you. But most of all, I want this crying to stop. And when it doesn't, Yancy harumped, yeah. That's hell on earth for me. Children do cry, sometimes for seemingly nothing. We'll work it out. Together, you're not going to be alone in this. We'll be co-parents nurturing a child in tandem as a team. Team, huh? I'd do anything for you, Jan. Climb mountains, fight the bad guys. Hell, I'm even adulting for you. Jancy grinned sheepishly. As you will for a child that is yours. You don't give yourself enough credit for how loving you are. Jen's heart skipped at Yancey's vulnerability. Yancey stilled her forward movement around the room, sank onto the couch next to Jen, and put her coffee on the slab of cedar she called her coffee table. Why do I think you plied me with lamb stew to coax me into having a child? <laughs> Jen shook her head and looked on her with total tenderness. Yes, yes, I did. She cupped Yancey's face, stared into the depths of bright brown eyes. I did it because I love you. I want you to think hard about your fears and say whatever you need to say. If you really don't want a, uh, uh, want a child, I'll understand. Thank you. Hi, I'm Riley Scott. I write lesbian romance published by Bella Books. I wish we could all be in Gulfport together, but I look forward to connecting with you online. Today, I'm going to be reading from my upcoming book, On the Rocks, which publishes in mid-March. A bit about On the Rocks. Chemistry and timing. They say you need both for a good relationship. But in On the Rocks, we find out what happens when chemistry collides with the worst possible timing. Alex Daniels, a free-spirited artist, meets Lennon Willis, the hard-headed owner of a bar, both fresh off of a breakup. Can they keep it to a one-night stand, or will ill-timed chemistry shake things up a bit? I'm going to read a bit from the first chapter. Hip-hop music thumped from the loudspeakers near her head, and Lennon closed her eyes. She danced unashamedly. Cheers, she heard her best friend Grant's voice boom through the crowd as he approached and shoved another lemon drop shot in her direction. You know I hate these fruity drinks, she scowled, but softened it to a smile and mouthed, thank you, so as not to appear ungrateful. I know, he said, rolling his eyes, but if you'd for once stop worrying about acting tough and just drink it, you'd find out it's actually delightful. It was a conversation they'd had a hundred times. And given their propensity to go out on Tuesdays when Lucky's, the local gay bar, ran a special on lemon drops and Vegas bombs, it was one they'd likely have a hundred more. As she gulped down the shot and returned the cup to him, the beginning notes of a share song came over the speaker. She beckoned Grant over to dance with her. And as they danced, she caught sight of a brunette sitting in the corner. 
Pulling Grant closer, she looked over his shoulder, analyzing her. Someone who looked as out of place there as a flower in a snowstorm. Amidst the crowd of sweaty dancers sat the tall woman. Her multicolored paint-splattered jeans contrasted, yet worked seamlessly with a newspaper-printed shirt and a vibrant yellow scarf. Lennon moved Grant out of the way, and as he bobbed his head sideways, he followed her glance. He laughed. Don't, he said softly. He was right. She knew. Nonetheless, she pushed him away gently. I'm going to grab a drink, she called over the music. No, you're not, but I'll see you at home. She could see him mouthing the lyrics to Peaches' Fuck the Pain Away, but ignored him. It had been his latest go-to in his attempt to soundtrack her life, despite the time she'd insisted she wasn't in pain. True to her word, she stopped by the bar. Angel Zimby, double, neat, with a splash of water, she ordered when the bartender nodded in her direction. As he poured her drink, she glanced back to the seat where the woman sat. Finding the spot empty, she reminded herself it was likely for the best for both of them. Grabbing her whiskey from the bar, she made her way to the lounge chair in the corner and pulled out her phone. She heard a familiar ding and opened up Tinder. Damn, she muttered, seeing a message from last night's hookup asking for another date. A pang of guilt pierced her heart, but her fingers didn't hesitate in pushing the block button. Work's too busy right now, she thought, rehearsing the line she knew she'd give them if they happened to pop into her bar. It was busy, but that wasn't the reason. Even through a fog of alcohol, she couldn't lie to herself. As if on cue, her phone lit up with an incoming call from Lee, her most recent ex. Seeing her name pop up on the screen, she shuddered. Too little, too late. She hit ignore. She could call her back, get some answers to the questions she had, and find closure. Or she could do what she knew would feel better in the moment. Letting adrenaline fuel the willpower she'd been missing for too long, she blocked the number and shoved her phone angrily into her pocket. Hard pass on that one, I see. Lennon jumped and stood. Looking up, she gazed into the deep honey brown eyes of the woman she'd seen across the bar. Lennon forced a laugh, trying to catch her breath. Uh, I, just an old friend. Well, former friend, she cleared her throat. I'm Lennon, and you've got to be new to the area. The woman leaned back, a mixture of surprise and arrogance dancing in her expression, as the corners of her brightly painted red lips lifted into a slow smile. That I am, she said, raising an eyebrow. I take it you're the welcoming committee. Do you serve the whole town or just the gay bar? What's your name? Lennon asked, ignoring the question. She grabbed her whiskey and down the entire glass. Alex, she said, looking Lennon up and down. Well, Alex, her reply was cut off by Alex's lips descending on her own. They were soft, but she was anything but gentle as she pressed against Lennon's mouth. She felt the sigh escape her before she could stop it. Damn, she said, pulling away. She leaned back, eyeing Alex sideways. Do I get the tour or not? Alex asked. I suppose I've got the time, Lennon said as she signaled for Alex to follow her up to the bar. What are you drinking? Cab, she said. The bartender and Lennon couldn't help but analyze Alex's simple answer. Good in bed, artsy, decent taste in music, maybe just a touch crazy. Just Alex, or is it short for something? Small talk was a risky game. If you talk too much, sometimes they got attached. Or yet, sometimes she got attached. But she couldn't help herself. Alex seemed just as ready as Lennon was for a drink, a night together, and the parting of ways. Why do you care? Alex asked, playfully running her fingers up and down Lennon's arms and cementing her assessment. Fair enough, Lennon answered, handing the wine glass over to Alex before she paid the tab. Alex pressed the glass to her lips and smiled before taking a sip. Alexandra. Well, Alexandra, where did you come from before you decided to pop into Lucky's tonight? California, she said, sipping her wine and looking away. You're a long way from home, Lennon noted. Vacation, business, or relocation? We'll see. Could be all three. It was a game. Lennon knew as much, but her body tightened each time Alex sipped her wine. Each time she looked into Lennon's soul with those brilliant eyes. She'd play the game because she wanted, no, needed Alex's touch. 
When she'd left the house this evening, this hadn't been her intention. She glanced at Alex and ran her finger along the rim of the glass. Intentions be damned, because she wasn't about to miss out on this. Hi, I'm Lucy Dreamer, and this is an excerpt from my book, The Burden of Happiness. I mount my phone securely to the holder on my handlebars and hit the FaceTime button on Kate's number. As I hear it ring through my Bluetooth headset, I start up my bike and slowly pull back onto the road. I laugh when I hear her shriek when she connects to the video and sees the Golden Gate Bridge fill her screen. Sarah, what are you doing? I'm taking you for a drive across the Golden Gate Bridge, and then I'm going to park and we'll watch the sunset. Sarah, that's dangerous. I'm hanging up right now. The worry in her voice warms my heart, and I call out to her quickly. Hey, I'm not looking at you at all, I promise. I'm only listening. Eyes on the road, I swear. I grin as she sighs and mumbles something that I can't make out. Perhaps I should have waited to FaceTime you until I was over the bridge. I chuckle ruefully. Well, it is kind of romantic, she says begrudgingly. Yeah? As long as you don't crash your bike, yes she says, and I can hear the smile in her voice. I'm almost there, as you can see now. I signal to make my turn into the Golden Gate Vista parking lot. It's busy as the weather is nice, with only a few clouds that are beginning to be illuminated by the setting sun. I dismount and pluck the phone from the holder and switch the camera so she can see me. Is that a Kevlar jacket? She asks approvingly, and I nod before unbuckling my helmet strap with one hand and pulling it off. <laughs> Sexy, she says with a teasing giggle. I grin as I set my helmet down on my seat and fix my hair. I hold up a finger as I switch from my helmet Bluetooth to my AirPods. I lean on my bike and focus on her smiling face as I get my first good look at her. She's out on the back patio with her hair pulled into a ponytail, no makeup, and I can hear the dogs yipping in the background. I feel a mild pang in my chest at how much I miss her. We've been talking nearly every day since I called her and heard about her dad. Sometimes it's just a few minutes to check in, but more often we've been talking about future things, like trips we'd like to take, movies we'd like to see, or books we'd like to read. We're careful to steer away from us future talk, but it's there a quiet, steady undercurrent moving us along in the same direction. How are Otto and Gertie? Hup to no good as usual, she laughs, and they both jump up onto her lap. I did get their Halloween outfits, though. I'll FaceTime you when they have them on. Oh, please do. Hi, guys, I say, and their heads whip around comically, trying to find the source of my voice. You got them all riled up now, she complains half-heartedly and I can hear her coaxing them back onto the floor before she raises her phone and brings it closer. So where's this beautiful sunset you promised me? Okay, hold on. I walk toward the low wall to get an unobstructed view. I switch the camera so she can see the brilliant purples and oranges as the sun moves behind the low clouds until it dips under them just above the water. I watch her watching the sunset and smile contentedly. That was beautiful. I do miss the sunsets there, she says with a touch of wistfulness. I switch the camera back to me. Do you miss living here, I ask? I do. I did love the city. Any desire to move back? I watch her face closely. I love my job here. I really have been happy reconnecting with Taylor, and his friends are now my friends. And Dad is doing better. He's a full month sober now. The detox in the hospital nearly killed him, so I don't think he's keen to go through that again. He's actually talking about selling the business and traveling. We'll see how things go, though. He's more optimistic than I've ever seen him. I think it's good I'm here to support him. I nod and realize she didn't really give me an answer. It was an impulsive question that I didn't actually expect a definitive response to anyway. But Barstow isn't San Francisco, that's for sure, she says with a sigh. But I think it's where I need to be right now. I see. I think I did know the answer all along. 
Her life is there now, at least for the foreseeable future. But is mine here? I've been thinking a lot about it lately. So much so that I'm planning on bringing it up to Marsha in our next session. I bite my lip, contemplating for only a second. I'm kind of wondering if I'm where I need to be. I watch Kate's eyes light up, and then she quickly tempers her expression. Are you thinking of moving back here, to Barstow? Her voice sounds mildly incredulous, but maybe a little hopeful, too. I could be imagining the way her lips curl up a little on the right side of her face. It's on the table. I think I might have exercised my demons sufficiently while I was there. I say it with a wry smile, but I think it's true. It reminds me of one thing I haven't told her yet. I don't want to bring up my past at the moment, but I think it's the right time. I confronted Kyle while I was there, on my last day, with his wife and kids in the house. Her eyes go round in surprise, and then her brows furrow in concern. You did? Sarah. I told him to choke on his shitty apology letter. It felt good. He has no power over me anymore. I, Sarah, that's so brave. Weren't you scared? At first, yes, but then I wasn't. It felt like necessary step in order to start taking my life back. Well, for what it's worth, I'm very proud of you. That took incredible courage. Also, if I would have been with you, I would have been tempted to make his wife a widow. She delivers a statement with a steely gaze, and my bark of laughter comes so unexpectedly I have no time to suppress it. I had not been prepared for that response from her. Her defense of me grabs at my chest, and I bite my lip to keep from crying. Hi, I'm Becky Bowen. I'll be reading from A Light on Altered Land, my novel that came out last year. It's the story of two women, Ellie Belmont, a retired community college teacher, and Katherine Kepler, a retired psychotherapist, both in their late 60s, finding love after loss. They meet by chance in a Minneapolis coffee shop, and after a few weeks of growing friendship, embark on a cross-country trip. The first night on the road, they become lovers. Here is the scene where they finally make it to bed. They were not abashed virgins blushing with inexperience. Together, they brought over 90 years of sexual history to their consummation. Nor were they self-conscious apologists, embarrassed by their wrinkles and collagen dimples. They were simply two mature women caught in a fireball of lust, tempered by wisdom and kindness. Skin tasted skin as the full length of their bodies met. For minutes they kissed and grasped and reveled in a delicious sensual downpour, slaking a Saharan thirst. And then, as if on cue, they pulled back. Is this really happening? Ellie whispered. You're here? Catherine nodded, her face flushed. Yes, the two of us. They stroked each other's hair and sought the firm land in the other's eyes. We're not given many times like this, are we? Ellie said. No, we're not. As their eyes held, a tacit knowing arced between them that this would be the last first time in their lives. They breathed each other's names then, confessed their love in the treasured, intimate tones only lovers share, and interlaced their limbs in a transcendent embrace. Alas, even sacred moments are not foolproof. The dry communion wafer lodging at the back of a celebrant's throat, the groom toppling over in a faint at the altar, the giggles erupting at a silent retreat. And so it was that before Ellie had the blessed opportunity to tap the lodestone, the gyrations of these jubilant bodies sent the lovers 
on a premature launch. Oh, Catherine cried, her eyes large in surprise. I'm coming, but I'm not touching you. I know, Catherine panted. God have mercy, but don't move your leg. I'm still, oh, yikes. Laughter replaced the sound of lovemaking. The kisses turned kittenish. The clutching loosened to featherweight strokes. I don't think that was right, Catherine said. Did I just flunk lesbianism 101? No, sweetheart. You jumped to the head of the class from zero to all in record time. Hello, everybody. My name is Rita Potter, and I'm here to tell you about my book, Broken Not Shattered, that will be released on April 15th by Sapphire Books. It is my very first book to be published and hopefully not my last. So I'm pretty new to this game, but I hope I can um, talk a little bit about the book and maybe you might be interested in reading it. I think I'd like to start by um, reading the back cover blurb to give you a sense of what the book is about. And in a little bit, I'll do a reading. Back cover blurb starts with, even when it seems hopeless, there can always be a better tomorrow. Jill Bishop has one goal in life, to survive. Jill is trapped in an abusive marriage while raising two young girls. Her husband has isolated her from the world and filled her days with fear. The last thing on her mind is love, but she sure could use a friend. Alex McCoy is enjoying a comfortable life with great friends and a prosperous business. She's given up on love after picking the wrong woman one too many times. Little does she know, a simple act of kindness might change her life forever. When Alex lends a helping hand to Jill at the local grocery store, they're surprised by their immediate connection and an unlikely friendship develops. As their friendship deepens, so too do their fears. In order to protect herself and the girls, Jill can't let her husband know about her friendship with Alex, and Alex can't discover what goes on behind closed doors. What would Alex do if she finds out the truth? At the same time, Alex must fight her attraction and be the friend she su suspects Jill needs. Besides, Alex knows what every lesbian knows. Don't fall in love with a straight woman, especially one that's married. But will her heart listen? Um, now, a a as you can see, the, the subject matter of this is a pretty tough subject matter, domestic violence. And I, I certainly hope that doesn't scare anyone away. I I'm a social worker. My education is in social work. I didn't realize this about myself because I'm a big optimist, but I tend to write characters who are struggling with something pretty big, um, something external or internal demons, um, because I, I find those people the most interesting because the hope and the triumph over what life gives them for me is very rewarding and meaningful. So that's why I've chose the, the type of um, books that I, I write. Um, I do want to assure you, I, I know as a reader, I don't like to read a bunch of violence. And as, as a writer, I certainly don't want to write a bunch of violence. So I was really careful in, in, in when I did that to, um, I didn't want to minimize the violence because it's real, but I did a lot of fade to black. I, I left it to the, to the reader to decide what was going on. So I, I hope the subject matter doesn't frighten you because it really is a book about hope and it's about, um, having a better tomorrow, no matter what lot you have in life. So with that said, I'd like to give you a brief reading. Um, this is from the very first chapter. Um, it starts in the middle of the first chapter. Um, Jill has arrived at Alex's um, door in the middle of the night, woke her up from a sound sleep, and has shown up in, in some pretty rough shape. And, and I will take it from there with my reading. In order to regain her composure, Alex turned away under the pretense of preparing the shower. She adjusted the temperature and flicked her hand under the jets to ensure the water was warming. Satisfied that it was, she opened the linen closet, pulled out a fresh towel, and draped it over the shower rod. Alex looked back as Jill was sliding her sweatpants down her narrow hips. Alex's eyes widened when she saw the dark, red blotch on Jill's panties. Bile rose in her throat, but she forced it down. Jill stood naked and exposed like a battered child. Alex wanted to comfort her, but she didn't know how. So she stepped forward and brushed a bloody wisp of hair from Jill's eyes. 
Jill stepped into the shower and Alex picked up her discarded clothes. She left the room and hurried to the half bath. The toilet lid was barely up before she lost the contents of her stomach. She stood over the toilet bowl for several minutes in case her stomach decided to revolt again. Finally, she flushed the toilet, splashed cold water into her face, and ran her hand through her short hair. When she glanced in the mirror, she was surprised by how pale she looked. Angrily, she took the bloody clothes into the laundry room, wishing she could burn them. Instead, she treated the blood with stain remover and threw them into the washing machine. She scrubbed her hands vigorously in the utility sink, erroneously believing they were covered in blood. Alex could still hear the shower running when she went to the kitchen. She opened the pantry door and scanned the bottles. She located Jill's favorite, Pinot Grigio, and pulled it from the wine rack. She positioned the corkscrew over the top of the bottle and twisted. Still shaken, she missed her target and the spiral dug into the cork at an unnatural angle. Alex swore she struggled to straighten the opener so it would grip the cork, enough to allow her to remove it. After some maneuvering, the cork popped out without leaving any remnants behind to fall into the wine. She emptied the bottle into two glasses and swirled the liquid to ensure it was free of debris. When Alex returned to the bathroom, Jill was finished in the shower. Jill had slipped on Alex's thick terry cloth bathrobe and looked small and frail as she wrapped it around herself. Without a word, Alex handed her one of the glasses. Jill's hand was shaking when she brought the glass to her lips, and the liquid sloshed against the sides. A thousand vice grips tightened around Alex's chest when she looked at the shattered woman in front of her. Alex's new anger was the last thing Jill needed, so she choked on her rage and moved closer. She looked at Jill, tenderly, and tentatively reached out her hand. Jill responded by clutching Alex's hand, but she still didn't speak. Alex led her from the bathroom into the bedroom. The covers were askew from where Alex had been sleeping not long ago. Jill stiffened when the two reached the bed, but said nothing. Jill obediently got in, her demeanor suddenly making Alex uneasy. What little life Jill had left in her eyes flickered out, and she opened her robe. God, no! Alex was unable to find any other words. She wrapped the robe tightly around Jill and covered her with a soft blanket. Uh, that's the end of my reading. Um, like I said, it's Broken Not Shattered by Rita Potter, and I hope you'll give it a try. Thank you. I'm Carol Ann Douglas. I used to be on Off Our Backs, the Women's News Journal. Now I'm writing fiction. I'm going to read from my novel, Lancelot, Her Story, in which Lancelot is a woman in disguise and a lesbian. The book is available in print and ebook from Amazon or in print from me. My website is www.carolandouglas.com. Lancelot and Guinevere are in love, but Lancelot keeps away from Guinevere because she does not realize that Guinevere sees she is a woman and because Guinevere is married to the king. In this scene, Lancelot has just come back from a war with the Saxons. The scene also includes Griffith, a warrior with severe PTSD. Guinevere stopped in the great hall. She hoped to see Lancelot, who was there, clenching her right hand into a fist and unclenching it, while she listened to a guard who looked at her as respectfully as if she were the king himself. Guinevere hardly dared to approach her for fear that Lancelot would be unable to talk to her. Griffith, sword raised in his hand, came rushing into the hall. His once handsome face was unshaven and contorted with rage. Saxons, the filthy Saxons are here. I saw them in the courtyard just now. No, Lord, they were our own men, said a guard, and Griffith smote him down with a blow that would have spilled his brains had he not been wearing a helmet. Lancelot hurried to Griffith, apparently to prevent him from slaughtering the guards. No, Griffith, there are no Saxons here. Give me your sword, she said in a calm voice. Filthy sea witch, I'll send you to Woden. Guinevere cried out, No, Griffith, it's Lancelot. Lancelot did not draw her sword. I'm Lancelot. Put aside your weapon. You're at Camelot. There are no Saxons here. Lancelot moved towards him with her empty arms extended, but he lunged at her. Frenzied with a fear she had never known before, Guinevere rushed between them. Lancelot gasped, Stay back, Lady Guinevere! Griffith, pray help me, Guinevere said, summoning her most womanly tones. The Saxons are in the courtyard. Come out and fight them there. Though his sword was in the air, ready to strike Lancelot, Griffith halted. In the courtyard? Guinevere clutched his arm. Yes, please come. 
The ladies are much afraid. Make haste. She turned to the door that led to the courtyard and gestured for Griffin to go before her. Lancelot quickly followed, as did several guards. A number of them grabbed Griffin from behind and took away his sword, subduing him without hurting him. But Lancelot, who was trembling, took hold of Guinevere's arm and pulled her into a nearby passageway. My lady, you are very brave and very clever, but you should not have taken such a risk. Lancelot's touch thrilled Guinevere. Why not? Your life is worth more than mine. That is not so, Lancelot exclaimed. She looked at Guinevere as if she were an angel descending from heaven. I am only a warrior. You are queen of all Britain. What of it? You are a better person than I am. Guinevere tried to express her love in her gaze and her tone, if not her words. For once, Lancelot had abandoned her reserve. Please kiss me, Guinevere prayed silently. My lady, you are finer than anyone else in the world, Lancelot said fervently. She quist kissed Guinevere on the mouth. Guinevere was filled with joy at the touch of those soft lips, but Lancelot pulled away. Pardon me, she gasped. I pardon you for kissing, but not for ceasing to kiss. Kay the seneschal rushed up, calling out, Lady Guinevere, are you well? Lancelot moved back several steps. Had Kay witnessed their kiss? Oh, surely not, for Guinevere saw nothing but concern in his face. Other warriors and ladies followed him, all of them exclaiming over Guinevere. Over and over, she assured them that she was unhurt. While Guinevere was thus surrounded, Lancelot slipped away. It had been too good to be true. Lancelot might never kiss her again. Guinevere realized that, although the fear of dying had kept her from wanting a child, her own life was less important to her than Lancelot's. She had never imagined that she could care more about someone else than she did about herself. Lancelot hurried off to the walls to watch for the troops return. What a reckless fool she had been. Should she again ask for Guinevere's forgiveness? No, it's better to say nothing, for she might say too much, and so might the queen. What incredible sweetness there was in Guinevere's lips. Brief as the kiss was, it was softer and warmer than Lancelot could have imagined. Her lips felt miraculously, no, sinfully, good. She knew she would cherish the memory or be haunted by it forever. Hi, my name is M.B. Cachetta, and um, I'm the author of a novel called Miracle Girls and a couple of book of short stories. Uh, and this one in particular, Pretend I'm Your Friend, is the book I'm going to be reading from today. Thank you to the um, organizers of this event. It's super cool and very uh, 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 COVID adaptive, I guess. Um, I am still recovering from COVID. I've had it, one of those lingering symptoms. So I sometimes get a little out of breath, but I'm going to try and read this anyway. Um, I, I'm, I'm doing better. Uh, it's been a lot of months, nine months. But anyway, um, I'm reading from a series of stories. I'm, I, was, I couldn't figure out which one to read. There's um, Hands of God, there's uh, Alice James's Cuban Garlic, and there's one called Marry Me Quickly, and it's a story about a family. And when I was writing it, I noticed that the, um, the characters were all named after my brothers. So there's a mother named Rusty, and I have a brother named Rusty, and there's a, the, the main, one of the main characters named AJ, uh, Alice James, of course, who um, is kind of a force of nature, and she is named after one of my brothers. And then um, Andy, the gay character, the, the, the youngest brother, uh, who a lot of the activity is swirled around, uh, is also a brother. Um, I didn't know why, like why, why, why was that happening? So finally figured out that um, I wanted to understand my family's point of view. Um, they are Trumpers and they, uh, I, w I wondered what they felt about me coming out and then kind of leaving the family, uh, not feeling welcome. Um, and so in this story, the family is invited to a gay wedding. And that's Andy's wedding, and it's all about they're trying to get there. It involves a, a brother-in-law who has brain cancer and a s school bus that they wrangle and try to take through the mountains to get to the gay wedding, and that's the third thing, the third um, 
a story. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a little COVID brain. But um, so I wanted to read the first story, which is called Hands of God. And it is uh, about Alice James, who when she is a teenager in high school, her best friend who's a year older than her and works at the Procter Gamble in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, um, they manage to save all their money and go on a trip to Italy. And Hel- uh, uh, Alice James is in love with her best friend, Helena. And um this is what the story's about. When they're there, they do end up, Alice James buys a piece of art, which later becomes the present she gives her gay baby brother on his wedding day, which is also quite a whirlwind story. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit of it. It's called Hands of God. Helena Frankel has the squarest teeth A.J. Wojak has ever seen. It strikes her as odd to realize this now of all times, well into their third adma- third mid-Atlantic hour of flight to a place neither has been before, though really neither has been anywhere. Helena is the most beautiful girl in all of Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, place of their birth, and exactly nowhere. And yet, in the back of AJ's mind, she's starting to realize she's growing bored in their friendship antsy. The thought is nearly unthinkable, so AJ revises she's growing bored with Helena's breakup saga which has been the topic of conversation nonstop since boarding the plane at five this morning. Neither here nor there, AJ thinks wistfully, looking out at the clouds. Before today, Helena had spoken in absolute terms. Italy, finally. She and Helena saved up money for two years, arranged the timing of this trip carefully, sorting out AJ's high school vacation and Helena's holiday work schedule at the factory's administrative office. Maybe the real problem is that AJ is no longer stoned, which means she is irritated, which means she suggests a trip to the bathroom, which she will do as soon as she can get a word in edgewise. In the meantime, her slow, buzzing mind has lazily landed on the nature of bicuspids. Helena's are bone white, perfectly round for the tearing of flesh, though she is strictly a vegetarian, which AJ admires. Also, due to a slight speech impediment, even the hardest consonants slipping from Helena's lips are wet and smooth. It's a pleasant sound, Helena talking, if you can loosen your mind around the tedious content. The timing is the problem. Two days before their departure, Helena discovered her boyfriend, Gordon Johnson, a foreman at the P&G, in bed with someone else. Not just someone. Helena says, reviewing the facts, but two someones. I mean, Gordy was in bed with a couple, AJ, a girl, and her husband. Helena clutches the love note she found stuffed in Gordy's wallet, which almost caused her to cancel first to cancel first the relationship and then the trip. The uh, only trouble was that A, she is in love with Gordy, and B, Easter is the only week she can take off work without it affecting her paycheck. Proctor and Gamble is closed Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the following Monday. There is a world, AJ tells herself, a wide, wide world. I mean, a threesome, AJ, Helena says, a married couple with a baby and everything. So lots of things happen on their trip, uh, including a kiss in a famous cathedral, a couple of boys, some sex, and um, the purchase of of a piece of art that later becomes a present um, representing love. So I hope that you will all um, look for my book, and um, I hope that you are all well and safe, and uh, that we will see each other again in person sometime um, soon, maybe the spring or the summer, next fall, for sure. Thank you, and thanks again to the um, the organizers of this uh, wonderful um, readout. Hi, readout. I am Lila Bruce, and today I'm going to be reading from Falling Slowly, which is an enemies to lovers romance involving Quinn, who is an ex-Army helicopter pilot, and Allie, who is Quinn's sister's boss. The two find themselves being drawn together at a wedding uh, over a long weekend near Asheville, North Carolina. So here we go. Where are my pants? Quinn asked. You have no idea what happened, do you? Allie said from the kitchen bar. 
Quinn sat at one of the bar stools that sat along the edge of the kitchen. Not a damn clue, Quinn frowned. All she had was a fleeting image of Allie's Uncle Barney handing her a cracker. Food poisoning. Food poisoning? Allie nodded. Bad tuna salad. Luckily, or maybe unluckily, I guess, depends on how you look at it. No one else but you had any of it. We had to take you to the hospital and they gave you a shot of something to stop the vomiting. Knocked you on your ass. They all came back to quit in pieces. Uncle Barney handing her tuna salad on a cracker. Aunt Marge walking her across the ballroom. Allie's father. Oh my God. Aunt Marge told your dad that you and I lesbian together. Quinn felt the blood leave her face. <laughs> lesbian together? She laughed and shook her head. Aunt Marge is insane. Oh God, Allie, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to out you to your family. I mean... I don't know if I did or if you're gay or if not. I mean, I kind of thought you were, but you didn't come out and say you were. And then Marge was talking about prospects and Barty was talking about Lebanese. And there was something about the Atlanta Braves and I'm gay. Quinn snapped her head up to look at Allie. What? The other woman smiled and nodded her head. I'm a lesbian. It's okay. You didn't out me. My family knows. It's not a big deal. Quinn stared. She wasn't sure if it was the fact that it had been such a big deal in her own family or... A sudden thought struck her. Quinn raised her eyes to meet Allie's. She already suspected the answer, but had to know for sure. Who undressed me? Allie took another bite of the bagel before answering. I did. Quinn shifted uncomfortably on the, lo on the leather bar stool. Thank you, she said stiffly. She knew it shouldn't bother her that Allie had seen her, seen Oliver, the hideous sight that was her leg. Her cheek stung as she has a sudden flash of memory, that last argument with Lori and the words that the woman who had once professed her love had spit out just before walking out the door. Disgusting, revolting, makes me want to throw up. Quinn started as she felt soft fingers wrap around her wrist. Hey, Allie said lightly. Are you okay? Quinn nodded but said nothing. Allie held her gaze but didn't release the grip on Quinn's wrist. Quinn, can I ask two questions? Quinn shrugged. Sure, I suppose so. Did Morales make it off the mountain? If Allie hadn't been holding on to her wrist, Quinn might have fallen off the barstool. What? Sergeant Morales, did he make it off the mountain, or did something happen to him? You talk in your sleep, and you carried on several conversations with Morales over the past two days, and he seemed to be a nice person. You mentioned some others, but I got the impression that none of them made it out, so I was curious as to what happened to him. Quinn blinked as she felt tears well up. No, no, he made it. Well, good. Allie said, continuing to grasp Quinn's wrist and slowly began rubbing circles on her arm with the tip of one finger. Quinn watched, feeling tiny shivers run up her arm with each delicate touch. He was right, you know, Allie said. What? Quinn was hypnotized by the movement of the other woman's finger. Some chicks do dig scars. What? I don't know what else to say it, Allie said. I'll be honest with you. When I got, uh, when I got up close and personal look at your scars, I... Uh, I didn't know what to think. Really, Quinn murmured. Really? Except to know that the more I'm with you, the less I see this. The touch became a caress and slowly moved to the scar at the nape of Quinn's neck. And the more I just see you, and the more I like to see of you, if you'll let me. Allie, uh, she began, her voice faltering, as Allie deepened her caress and she felt her eyes close of their own accord. Quinn felt a warmth like liquid fire spread from Allie's touch threatening to consume her. Quinn shifted on the bar stool and she felt cool air run across her bare legs. She pulled back from Allie and shook her head as if she'd been in a trance. I, I need to go get dressed. Allie nodded. I understand, she said flatly and leaned back off the bar. She picked up the half-forgotten bagel and took a bite. Quinn stood from the bar stool and began to move back towards the bedroom. She ignored the familiar throbbing in her left leg as she as she walked. For once, the smoldering pain that had plagued her was overshadowed by a deep, hotter ache that seemed to burn from the nape of her neck all the way down to her core. As she reached the bedroom, she stopped. What the fuck was she doing? What was the other question? She asked, staring straight ahead. She could see her reflection through the mirror in the bathroom. What? You said you had two questions. What was the other? I don't suppose it's very important now. I'd like to hear it. There was the briefest of silence, and then Allie stepped up behind Quinn. They stared at one another through the reflection in the mirror. I was going to ask if you like peanut butter. I can honestly say I didn't see that one coming. Peanut butter? 
Mm-hmm, Allie said, taking a step closer to Quinn. I just wanted to make sure that you weren't allergic to peanuts or anything. Uh, no. She felt her breath hitch as Allie's hands slowly began to rub up her back. Well, after the tuna salad incident, I didn't want to do anything else that might send you back to the hospital. Quinn turned to face Allie and suddenly found herself being pushed against the living room wall, Allie's lips pressing hard against hers. She kissed her open mouth, Allie's lips seeming to devour her own. Quinn caught the faintest taste of peanut butter as her tongue sparred with Allie's. She felt her body mold against the other woman's heat exploding everywhere that Allie's hands moved. Allie deepened the kiss, turning her hot lips to the soft skin along Quinn's ears and neck. Quinn gasped, taking a deep breath as Allie licked and kissed, trailing fire along the way. Oh God, Quinn groaned, feeling her legs buckle. It felt so good, but all this was happening too fast. Quinn pulled away from the, the kiss, her breathing ragged. Allie stared back at her panting. I, I, Quinn, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Quinn interrupted, her, she, her cheeks flushing. I just need a little time to process. I, I understand. Allie smiled and nodded down at the pink t-shirt that now seemed to be sculpted to Quinn's body. There's a mall not too far from here. I saw it on the way back from the hospital the other night. What do you say we go borrow Marge's car and get you something decent to wear? Song. I am the water, turquoise in my heart, purple, labia-like, rich capes to enfold. I am cold, the cold to awaken you. After you scream and shudder, after you clench up, holding yourself back from me, giving as little as possible until we meet in the same heat imperative. Then you open your strength and dive under and move. I am the water burst into rainbows, afterwards in the sun. I lie on your skin, alive with diamond light. <laughs>